There are moments when the boundaries between dimensions blur. Time is elastic and you can slip right through its cracks, finding the ground you were standing upon dissolving, coming back into focus centuries earlier. And nothing and everything has changed. We are born, we die, we weep, and we love, just as we've always done. This is the story of my time travel, back to the underbelly of Los Angeles, before the glamour of the movie business, at the dawn of the 20th century, and the power players who built the city. Madams, crib lords, politicians, and entrepreneurs. Some of the characters once walked the same streets we do. Others are imagined. These are the lost stories of my hometown and the inhabitants I came to know through dusty archives and hallucinations and in dreams. Well done with the step there. Um, In heels. I know, right? I am an avid, avid, avid reader, and your book, I have to say, is actually a work of art. It's beautiful. It's so sexy. Thank you. Like, just very cool. And I was was aiming for sexy. Well, (laughs) I mean, was this kind of a logical continuation for you um, after Pretty Things, which was an HBO doc about burlesque? Well, you know, I was actually fascinated with prostitution and courtesans much Mm -hmm. earlier. When I was in high school, I used to fantasize about buying the library across the street from school and turning it into a brothel. This is, obviously, it's not legal in my imagination. And I would have... Wait, 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 we have to go back. (laughs) I'm sorry. What spawned this fantasy? You know, I think I saw The Mayflower Madam starring Mm -hmm. Candace Uh, Bergen when I was about nine. Okay. And I just became fascinated with the topic. And I thought that if I was a woman and I was born in the 15th century, what would my choices be? Mm -hmm. I could devote myself to God and lock myself up in a convent. I could be married to someone who I didn't choose for a matter of class and circumstance and be locked up in a chastity belt while he went off to fight the Crusades. Or what was the other choice for women? Well, either way, it was defined by your Mm -hmm. sex. So I think I was just always fascinated by women who lived outside of what society deemed correct. Um, Hence the fascination with burlesque queens and striptease. And while I was researching that book, um, you know, some of my some of my subjects had, I would call them courtesans at not or high price call girls. Mm-hmm. Some some of them had had done that um, out of necessity, and I knew that I wanted to write a fiction, a work of fiction, and I knew I wanted to set it in that world. And you're from Los Angeles, born and raised, even though you went to college here. Uh, how did you come up? I had no idea that this existed, that this whole world existed in LA. You kind of always assume that people move there to be in movies or, or pan for gold, and that's it. Yeah, people don't realize that there was a Los Angeles before the movie business, but I like to uh, tell people who think L.A. is a cultural wasteland, which it's not, that we had the Fifth Symphony in the Nation in 1898. Um, so downtown L.A. was really well-developed. I think just the whole cult of celebrity and movies has become synonymous with Los Angeles and the popular imagination or you think, exactly, panning for gold, the Wild mm-hmm. West. But the yep. streets were paved. There was fashion. There was ostrich feather farms for the latest fashions. And, um, and, a, and a booming vice district. Booming district of Chinatown, opium deads, and brothels. Both high rent and low rent. How did you do your research? I'm trying to find one of my favorite p- sections here, which was about birth control. And I use the term very, very, very loosely <laughs> because it involved carbolic acid, if I recall correctly, which mm-hmm. sounds so hot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would say birth control methods have definitely improved in the last hundred years, although I still think we have some ways to go. Um, I love research. I love being in a library. I think that was the hardest part was actually knowing when to stop mm-hmm. digging. I, 
did the, the work in my imagination first and went into the libraries afterwards for the ephemera and the illustrations. Um, and it was really fun. I mean, I spent three months just reading the census records from 1840 to 1910 on microfiche. <laughs> I know, that I sounds... mean, I know it sounds really geeky, but to me, that's, that's mm -hmm. how I get off. That is my erotic fantasy, it involves being in a library. Well, this is so, prophylactics are required by the madams in the finer houses of prostitution and multitudes are in use. What kinds of prophylactics, I mean, you can read it in the book, but in your experience, what was the most, I guess, what was the most shocking thing that you learned that you were like, I can't believe people did this? I, I, I mean, when you write about and study sex, I feel like nothing shocks me anymore mm -hmm. in terms of, of human behavior, but, um, you know, animal intestines, Early condoms were made from animal intestines, lamb skins, um, uh, sheep's balls. <laughs> I saw a great picture of a condom <laughs> that uh, from the 16th century that had a little red ribbon uh -huh. around the end of it. So you, that's how you affixed it to the penis, is you tied it in a little bow with this red ribbon. Wow. So not very sturdy, actually. <laughs> But That's really a room cute. For error. It had a little drawing of a rose on it too. Oh. <laughs> um, and one thing that really struck me um, as not having changed at all is that the onus seems to be always put on the woman. That the women had to clean the customers and the women had to do all this stuff, and the men were just, you know. Yes. You well, I mean, it's their job, right? It's their job to. It's their. That's. This is a. It's a. It's a sex service industry, but. You know, what you, when you say how little things have changed, the whole premise of the book is that it's time travel. Mm -hmm. And we look at um, the past as though people are wearing different clothing or they don't have our technology, and we imagine their experience to be so different than ours. But basic human emotion, love, heartbreak, grief, sex, um, desire is the same. It's the same for our great, my great grandfather as yours as it is for us today. And you've been a fashion editor, you were a jewelry designer, you make movies. What is your writing process like when it comes to fiction? This was definitely a challenge for me because um, I'd never done it before, but I love to tell stories in general. Um, even the way I collect clothes, I always imagine the character, the person mm -hmm. who wore it, and what was she feeling and thinking and what was her perfume like. So it seemed like a natural progression to tell a story in this way. So how did you sit down to do it? I mean, it sounds like you did. You had to pry yourself from the library. Um, well, I had the characters, the six main characters in my head when I was working on Pretty Things, my burlesque work, um, and they just would, they just talked to me. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but I, you know, once I started writing, they told me what they wanted to do. It was a, just a very, it was a mm -hmm. natural process, I think. You know, I, I keep a journal or a composition notebooks. I wrote the book longhand in 26 composition oh, wow. notebooks. And I have That's so um, cool. images and uh, newspaper clippings and all sorts of mm -hmm. things pasted in them like diaries. So, and I wanted the finished book to feel a little bit like that, like a scientific document as though you, fa you traveled back in time and you found this record. I grew up in Germany and prostitution, I mean, when I was growing up there and still is legal and it always was, le uh, they legalized it, I guess, 25 years ago or so. Why do you think it's so taboo here? I think prostitution should be legalized because I think it would be advantageous for the women to have proper health care. Um, I think it would reduce violence against women. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it was legal at the time period that I'm writing, I'm writing this book. Um, and in the in Victorian society, women and men were not supposed to have sex out of procreation. So a married couple, the husband was not supposed to lay with his wife. He was if, supposed to practice self-control, you write. He, he was yeah. supposed to pa practice self-control. So prostitution was often really encouraged as a way for, uh, for a man to expend his... Speed, seed, um, <laughs> and women were not were taught not to have mm -hmm. orgasms because it would interfere with child with conceiving. Wow, that's you know this is around the same time too when the early um, versions of the vibrator are being developed. So, and you have this whole concept of female hysteria. So the idea of a woman of being course, in yeah. touch with her sexuality was just so far removed from society at the time that these fallen women were, um, were, 
were deemed the acceptable place for men to go. And Can we please talk about this improved vaginal spray? <laughs> Does, you guys, doesn't this look like something you'd want to own? Yeah, I think the um, menstrual cup, the, oh. me, the menstrual cup is a, is a pretty good one to imagine, you know, what, it, it right what, it, what the contraption you had to this wear. This is literally what it took to be a woman at that time. This is uh, amazing, right? This is a tampon. This is a, a present day tampon, basically. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to do next? Um, well, I want to make a television show of this. Of this, really? Uh, yeah, of this book. I've just finished writing a, another television show mm -hmm. um, uh, set in the fashion world, actually, contemporary. Um, yeah, I want to make a television show of this, and I think my next book is going to have something to do with space and consciousness. So totally not sex-related, shockingly. You, and I assume if you the, a TV show for, uh, based, based on this book would have to be like HBO, AMC, FX... We'll see. Showtime. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. One hour drama, that's for sure. That's yeah. amazing. Who could who would you have playing the lead if you could have a dream oh, cast? Oh, I, I Oh come on, Liz. No, I because I, I'm really superstitious and I wouldn't want to jinx it. Okay. But I have a few people in mind. I have someone in mind for Mr. X. Not Tony Goldwyn. No, Tony well, Mr. X is British. Tony can do an accent. Uh, no, I have someone specific in mind. Tony actually read early drafts mm -hmm. of the book, and he was really supportive of, of my work and my dreams as a teenager to own a brothel. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> what older brother wouldn't want to I encourage mean, his younger you sister? You could always move to Germany and open a brothel. I, could, I could. I could. Well, I would operate it like a private club, and I would not take... Because actually, I feel that in, in Nevada, where prostitution is mm -hmm. legal, women have to sign a contract to spend a certain amount of months per year on that compound. They have to pay 60% of each trick to the house. They have to buy their wardrobe for, from the house, and it's not even a chic wardrobe. So I'm just saying, if I had a brothel, I would give 100% of the cut to the women. I'd have a house doctor on staff, piano player, shoe shine, shine service, really nice restaurants. Sushi. <laughs> well, I was thinking more like roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, but... You, you know, could do both. Sure, sure. There could be a sushi <laughs> option. <laughs> <laughs> Who, um, aside from your brother were your most trusted early readers? Um, the chair of history at USC in the Huntington, William Deverell, uh, was a real mentor of the project. Um, and then there's uh, an author friend of mine, Patrick DeWitt, who wrote a great book, Sisters Brothers. He read early drafts. Um, historians, really, other people in the academic world. As I said, I spent so much time in libraries. And I think in terms of my brother, he's just, it's great to have, I come from a family who's very supportive and encouraging of my creativity mm -hmm. and my interest in sexuality. Um, my mother was on the board of Planned Parenthood, and my first job was at Planned Parenthood when I was 13. So, you know. I officially I, love you. So That's awesome. <laughs> so I, my mother also was very encouraging of, of me exploring this work and Really shining, I mean, my, I feel both, both Pretty Things and Sporting Guide, my aim is to mm -hmm. shine a light on women who've been forgotten by society, you know, who in, in many cases have been, you know, buried in a field with no grave marker because of, of what they had to do oftentimes for a profession. And what did you, um, well, let me actually backtrack a little bit. Since this is a work of fiction, how important was it to you to get the historical component absolutely right? It's really tricky with a book like this, which is a hybrid, mm -hmm. because I'm using a lot of facts and interweaving it in the story. Um, and I love history, and I love the research. And at a certain point, you have to be willing to throw it away, because you want to draw people mm -hmm. into your characters and, and the story and their emotions. Um, so of course, the, the, the detail is really important, but it's definitely a fine line. And how did you know how to edit yourself? Um, I'm really good at being critical of myself. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I like to, I pare down a lot before mm -hmm. I present anything. And I, I had a really great editor for the book too, um, Lucas Whitman at Regan Arts, who, who, was, who was great and really encouraging. Because I, I actually originally wrote the book in third person, and then I completely rewrote it with each of the six main characters in, in first mm -hmm. person. 
Um, and so that was really fun because I would basically get into each of their heads and I guess coming from a film business background and having a lot of friends who are actors, I would start to like walk and talk around mm -hmm. like like Jack, who's a 17 year old gay hustler. I would would walk around the block and listen to Jay-Z and, you know, I kind of affect this swagger and that's where I'm a Mac. I'm the finest Mac that's, you know, <laughs> that's where that, that came from is thinking about, you know, what would the combination mm -hmm. of a 17 year old gay hustler in 1897 and a contemporary hip hop superstar walk and talk like? What was the first book that you can recall that changed your, or I don't want to say changed your life, but really fed your love of, uh, of writing and reading? Oh, there's so many. I mean, as a little girl, I loved A Secret Garden mm -hmm. and A Little Princess. I feel like those are go-tos. A lot of John Steinbeck. Um, I love James Baldwin, Giovanni's Room, I think is such a beautiful love story. Jean Genet, Our Lady of the Flowers. Um, oh, God, I love to read. I love going to the bookstore. I love buying new books. I love going to the library. And get, I, I remember I read The Three Musketeers when uh, maybe only five years ago, and I was like, oh my God, this is like the Born Identity films. This is where everything comes from, every action thriller. For me, it's so exciting mm -hmm. to get lost in a world that's totally your own, and it's just your imagination. So you can visualize the movie of what it is, and it's totally... And what would people be surprised to know that you read? That I've read? Mm -hmm. um, I had all of the Sweet Valley High books. I mean. Um, Ramona Quimby, age eight. A Wheatsy Bat. I don't, do you know Wheatsy Bat by mm -hmm. Francesca Lea Block? That's a cool, those are cool series. What would people know? I don't know, the Archie comics? Um... I don't, I don't know what would be surprising. I like this um, lowrider magazine called La Teen Angel um, from L.A. I love Thrasher magazine. I love anything skateboarding. Okay, that I would never have pictured. <laughs> that's that's I've cool. designed skate decks, actually, and a line of hoodies and um, T-shirts for Altamont Apparel. I is, love skate culture. Is there a book that you wish you'd written? Um, hmm... The Bible. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, Abe Small, right? I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, it'd pretty. It'd be pretty cool to be um, like Danielle Steele or Judith Krantz or Stephen King. That'd be or, kind of fun. Or um, Sidney Sheldon. I used to love his books. Yeah. Oh my God. Or maybe I don't know, Dr. Seuss. <laughs> And are you still designing jewelry? Um, I haven't been lately. No, I haven't been designing jewelry. But I've been writing this show that's set in the fashion world, so I'm getting my fix. All right, so what can you tell us about the show? I'm actually not allowed to say much, except that it's um, a, a French studio, mm -hmm. but it's international cast, English language, and it's, uh, it's like an empire meets madman, but set in the fashion, contemporary, in the fashion world. In New York? In Paris. Oh, how cool. Yeah. And so are you, so you've written all the episodes and are I've you? I've written the series this? Bible and the pilot. Okay. Um, and I just turned it in like 10 days ago. Wow. So I spent my summer writing. Wow. So you have a ton of free time. Yeah. I say with total sarcasm. I take a lot of free time. You know, I, I think it's really important. Intervals of idleness are essential mm -hmm. to creativity. You need to be able to stare at the wall and, and tune out because you never know what's going to strike you next, what path you want to wander down that may spark a match and another idea. Wait, how do you even do that? What do you mean? Like, I, ha, you're able to just completely disengage, like not check your phone and just, just I, think at I, I, time? Yeah, I, I mean, you have to set limits for yourself. I'll go through periods where I will say I'm not checking mm -hmm. my Instagram. I'm not checking my phone. I'm not checking my Instagram all weekend. Instagram's hard because I love to look at pictures, and then you get mm -hmm. in those Instagram K-holes. Um, I'm in, I mean, I'm in a real Snapchat moment right now. I don't know why, but I'm really fascinated with Kylie Jenner's Snapchats. I can't, <laughs> and Justin Bieber. I can't stop watching them. I'm actually fascinated with her house. The fact that at 18, she owns that house. And she has that whole, like, um, shampoo set up. I and, mean, like, a professional makeup area. Yes, yes, she like also the glam has a, room. Yeah. And she has a frozen yogurt machine. 
Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, she, she has her own frozen. Like just I've pressing. seen her at my favorite yo frozen yogurt place in LA. This is really exciting. <laughs> Okay, goal for self. You know you've made it when you've got a frozen yogurt machine. Yeah. No, but I remember I, would, I was like following along with all of her decoration and when she picked out the chandelier and the fireplace. And then I was like, what is wrong with me? I'm following along an 18-year-old as she decorates her mansion. You know, I was never into keeping up with the Kardashians, but for some reason that little Kylie Jenner, I'm just... I want to see like what her outfits are. I want to see the new lip color. It's, it's fascinating to me. Kylie, I hope you're watching this. <laughs> so we, let's uh, turn this over to the audience. I'm sure you guys have a few questions for the lovely Liz. But let me uh, first ask, what, who, made, who made your shoes? Um, these are Charlotte Olympia. Olympia, okay. Because yeah. we're, we're having a shoe off back there over who was most uncomfortable. Me. I think I am. You are? Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good. Um, you spoke a little bit about this, but what was the process for researching Sporting Guide? Um, well, I did most of my research at um, academic libraries in California, um, where the book is set. So a lot at UCLA Special Collections, USC, the Huntington Library. Um, by the time I went in to get the, the images in the book, and a lot of them that you saw in the trailer, I knew the story, so I kind of knew what I was looking for. But it's still always such a fun treasure hunt um, because a lot of the times, especially when you're researching sex or vice, um, they don't even know what they have in the archive. So, uh, you know, I found a map at the Huntington Library that they didn't even know they had that they completely restored after we had found it. Um, it really is like a, a nerdy treasure hunt, really. You just have to have a lot of patience to be... Like, and librarians are so cool, too, because everyone specializes in different things, and you meet all sorts of characters. Like, I met this cop that he, just for fun, he likes to research cold cases. Like, on his spare time, that's what he does. Or, you know, there's someone else who's, mm -hmm. like, really interested in um, 17th century violins, but they, uh, you know, they make electronic music. So you meet all sorts of cool people in the library. Uh, we have a question from an online viewer. Madison would like to know, do you like writing books or making movies better? Um, writing books can be really lonely because you're stuck in a room by yourself and you have no idea if what you're doing is any good. And, and making film or television is collaborative, so you get to work with a lot of people, which is, which is, which is cool because you have feedback. But it's really special to me to write books because when it's done, it's something that someone else who buys it, it becomes their own. It's like their treasured object. Because there's been so many books that I've loved and I've treasured and you know, I've turned to in dark times. So it's nice to be able to, to give that to someone else. And I actually had another question about your research process. Because as you said, so many of these stories are about the, the people who were forgotten, like the man who had syphilis or, or prostitutes. How did you track down those histories if most of these people probably weren't even named when they were buried? Well, it's fiction. So, um, you know, things are loosely mm -hmm. based. There's uh, several characters in the book who were real people. Cora Phillips, mm -hmm. who is a madam, um, who I, we actually just found her gravesite last year after I'd already finished the book. Um, uh, very little was known or written about her, and I completely fictionalized it. But a lot of the stories repeat themselves in, in the, these professions. So you kind of try to stay true to the true to the genre, but also true to your imagination. Mm -hmm. And I think we have time for one more question, please, in the back. Hi, uh, I was curious, if after researching this book, or for this book, do you see yourself like doing anything futuristic sci-fi? Because it's kind of fun to look into the past and you can kind of tell where the future's going. I'm just curious what you thought about that. Um, well, actually, I've been, I've been getting really fascinated with space travel um, and, and space travel and technology in the last couple of years. I've been spending some time with NASA, JPL, um, engineers, and uh, so yes, absolutely. I mean, I find it all fascinating, past, present, and future. So whatever can um, help me understand more about humanity and, and what is possible. Well, thank you so much, Liz, and thank, thank you. you guys. And this book really is lovely, just lovely. Thank you. Thanks. I wish you'd done one about New York, too. You could do, like, part Maybe two not. about New York. Thank you.